Good morning, scholars. Today we're going to continue with Lesson 5 of Fars Homeric Greek and continue talking about the distinctions and characteristics of the Greek verb. Okay, so the Greek verb shows distinctions of voice, mood, verbal noun, tense, number, and person. So for right now, we're going to be focused on voice, mood, tense, number, and person. Number and person we've already talked about somewhat. So there are three voices in Greek, the active voice, the middle voice, and the passive voice. The active and the passive should be familiar to you from English. The middle voice is new and reading A. The middle voice usually denotes that the subject acts on him or himself or for him or herself. So, lu o my, the future is I wash myself as opposed to lu o, I wash kuna, the dog. Okay, uh, moon o my is I defend myself or ward off on my behalf you know, a fly, an enemy. Okay. There are likewise four moods in Greek. There's the indicative, the mood of reality, the subjunctive, the optative, and the imperative. Okay. These are finite, called finite moods because the person is defined by the ending. Okay. We've already seen the endings of the indicative. Okay. The infinitive, likewise, is though strictly a verbal noun is sometimes classed as a mood and we'll talk about the infinitives in particular down the road okay the meanings of tenses and moods okay um in the synopsis that is in smythe when he lays out the full system of um tenses in abbreviated form the meanings are given whenever these are not dependent on the use of the various forms in the sentence. The meanings of the subjunctive and optative forms and the difference between the tenses can be learned satisfactory, fa satisfactorily only from the syntax. Okay, But he gives some of the meanings here. The subjunctive, luomen or lusomen, can mean let us loose or Aeon luo, aeon luso can mean if I lose, hina grapo, that I may write. So, you know, let us lose the slaves, if I lose the slaves, and that I may write a letter, um, I find some time in my day. Okay, so these are various usages of the subjunctive that will be down the road, but, um, this gives you some sense of it. Likewise, be the optative, ete luoime, or ete lusaime, would that I may lose, would that I may lose, and a luoimen, or a lusaimen, if we should lose. Okay, so these are conditional and hortatory subjunctives and a whole slew of classifications that you'll learn from studying the syntax and once you actually get into literary text. Okay. So, um, again, returning to this notion of the various suffixes and prefixes, okay, these reflect the five characteristics of every finite verb, okay, of mood, tense, voice, person, and number. So, luomen, luete, where the primary stem of the verb is lu, to which the suffixes are added. So if you take a more complex example, like le lu goi te, you see three different, you see uh, the various elements. You see the mode or mood is the optative, the tense is the perfect, the voice is active, the person is third, the number is plural, and the primary stem is lu. So that le, as we'll learn, is the reduplication that signals the perfect. The lu is the stem. 
the k is the tense suffix, the omicron is the thematic vowel, the iota is the suffix uh, indicating the optative, and the te is the uh, ending, the plural, second person plural. So la lu goi te, okay, um, which can have various meanings. I just want to demonstrate how all these things are built into, you know, uh, would that I had, would that you all had, um, all these things are built into the verb itself without any auxiliaries. And that was, that's what makes the uh, Greek verb so complex. So again, the characteristics of finite forms are the personal endings, the augment in the sense in the in past tenses, reduplic uh, reduplication, voice, mood, and tense signs. So you have these uh, references to Smythe. So you can pause it here and study or look at these various things by following up on these uh, references. But augment, reduplication, tense sign, mood suffix, personal ending, uh, and voice, all these things get represented in the verb itself without any use of auxiliaries or without even necessarily mentioning the uh, person, you know, the use of the personal pronoun I or we. Okay. So the forms of a Greek verb fall into two main classes. The finite forms, which we've been talking about, indicative, subjunctive, optative, and imperative, and the infinite forms, um, the infinitive and the participle. And all that's meant by the infinite, infinite forms is that they are not characterized by first, second, and third person. They really just have the characteristics of singular or plural. They don't have the person's first, second, and third. They don't mark those. So um, a participle is a verbal adjective and is used like other adjectives. So I just wanted to give you a sense of that if you, you know, if you're not familiar with the term. Um, so usually in English, participles, the most common one is the ing ending. So losing, okay. But in Greek, it will be fully declined just like any adjective having a masculine, a feminine, and a neuter, and a singular and a plural. So, um, luon, luusa, luon, luontos, luuses, luontos, etc. And once you get into Greek, it's very important, or you will have to revisit the uh, Smythe section where he lays out the uh, inflection of the various tenses of the participle again and again to get used to them because it's a quite a bit more complex than it is in English. But I give you an example of an adjective, a uh, participle used as an adjective by rendering the soul releasing goddess. Okay, so a goddess like Artemis who would release the soul from life. Hesukain luusa dea. Hesukain Luusa de a. So if you know this, sukain is in the accusative because it's the object of the verbal idea inside the participle. And he de a, he uh, is the definite article modifying de a. And in Greek, you can get away with the separation. The goddess who releases souls, who releases the soul, okay, Hesukain du usa te a, the soul releasing goddess. Uh, the inflections of Greek allow a lot more creativity with the word order. But this gives you an idea of how um, a participle is used as an adjective, really, even in English. Okay. So the infinitive, on the other hand, is a verbal noun, formally used in several cases, but restricted in Greek to the old case forms of the dative and the locative. So luain, to release, you see that to, just like the dative means, you know, uh, I give the ball to John, you know, I, um, etc. Uh, 
So Luane is the present active infinitive of Luo. And again, I'll give you uh, a use of it. The daughter to release, he wishes. Okay, tele, he wishes, takes the infinitive, complementary infinitive, just like in English, I wish to go to school. <coughs> Tain tu gatera, luen tele. The daughter to release, he wishes. Okay, so again, we see the somewhat odd from the from the perspective of English word order of tain tu gatera, lu ein dele. Uh, okay, so um, again, going to a high level of generality, we're going to see down the road that there are thematic and athematic forms of verbs. And so these are the two classes and the thematic verbs are the Omega verbs, where we've seen the thematic vowel um, Omicron varying with Epsilon or Omega varying with Eta in the subjunctive. And then secondly, you have the Mi verbs. These are verbs that end with Mu, Iota in the first person singular. And um, they are sometimes called athematic verbs. But the Mi verbs are a challenge to learn. They usually come very late in any textbook, um, and they are uh, they need to be reviewed again and again and again. So those sections of Smythe where he gathers them all together are very helpful. Okay, thematic vowels again. We've already seen this. These are the ones that fluctuate in O and E, um, and then he goes on to say 801. Strictly speaking, no Greek verb is thematic or athematic throughout but certain of their forms are inflected thematically and others athematically. Uh, that's kind of a subtlety, but you'll see in Homer that he can go either way. Uh, he'll have a thematic or uh, athematic form of the same verb. Okay, uh, 804, in thematic inflection, the tense term varies between Omicron and Epsilon, as we've seen above. Okay, so that leaves us with the present indicative of Luane, which is lu o, lu es, lu e, and I include the duo here, lu eton, lu eton, okay, lu omen, lu ete, lu u se. Now, I really don't recommend learning the duels, uh, burdening yourself with the trouble of learning the duels. When I learned Greek uh, back, my first year of Greek back in, way back in, uh, 1979 at Columbia. Uh, I learned Attic Greek, so we didn't bother with the duels, learning the Attic dialect. And when I went to Homer, it was really no problem whatsoever picking up the duels in context with Homer. So that's how I'm going to treat it here. I think it would just be a burden to learn them. So I want you to write out and repeat just the three forms of the singular and the plural. Lu o lu es lu e, lu amen lu ate lu se. Okay. And so to conclude, we have our vocabulary of lesson five. We have aedo to sing, to chant, an, which is the equivalent of un, not. It's a prefix that negates something. Handano to please, atimazdo to dishonor, slight, or insult. That's what um, Agamemnon is going to do first to the priest of Apollo and then uh, to Achilles. Bino, to come, go, walk. Ace, a preposition with the accusative or an adverb, which means to, into, until, or there, in. Echo, have, to hold. Kaio, burn. Luo, loose, free, break up, destroy. Oleko, Kill, destroy, pimpo, sin, escort, conduct, teleo, accomplish, tuco, make, do, fashion, pero, to bear, carry, bring. So, ido, handano, atimazdo, bino, es, echo, kayo, luo, aleko, pimpo, teleo, Go, Barrow. Okay, so 
Have a great day. Continue to work hard. And I'll see you again soon.